for government offices, there is no specific change. Working hours remain 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. with um, from grade level 14 and above. For personalized services, mechanics, artisans, hair saloons, etc., who own their workshops or workstations and can clearly adhere to non-pharmaceutical interventions will be permitted to operate as normal. Uh, in, for markets, there is no specific all mandatory non-pharmaceutical interventions, restaurants to remain closed for eat-in with strict cleanliness guidelines, except for restaurants that are serving hotel residents. Bars, gyms, cinemas, event centers, and nightclubs remain closed, and this will be enforced. For educational activities, daycare and primary schools, all daycares and primary schools to remain closed till further evaluation. Schools are encouraged to continue with e-learning and visual teaching, but pupils may proceed to take the national common entrance as soon as is feasible, provided there is compliance with issued non-pharmaceutical interventions. For secondary and tertiary institutions, all schools to remain closed till further evaluation, arrangements to be made for exiting graduating students in JS3 and SS3 to resume at both boarding and day schools as soon as possible for intensive revision exercises. All educational establishments are to conduct exhaustive reviews to ensure compliance with the issued guidelines on COVID-19 before they open up for this purpose. And just to clarify, they will open up only for the purpose of exiting students. Arrangements to be made for students taking part in the NAPTEP and BEC exams, WAEC examinations, NECO and sub exams respectively. All schools must comply with the six recommended steps and required measures to be issued by the Federal Ministry of Education before an institution is reopened in the timeline to be provided. For churches and mosques, no specific change. Phase two remains. For recreational parks slash communal sports, restriction on communal sports remains and as well as the restriction on recreational parks until further evaluation. For funerals and weddings, no particular change. It's funerals and weddings to be limited to 20 people, including close family members. In summary, the PTF has recommended to Mr. President and Mr. President has approved the extension of phase two of the response with minor modifications. We are requesting for full compliance by the general public. We have to get this right this time round. We really need to stop playing Russian role with our lives uh, because if we continue to expose ourselves to COVID, there's no doubt that people will die. We also call on all the political leaders, the community and religious leaders to continue to support us, the PTF, to make sure that the communities are aware of the risks and compliance is improved. Um, I'll stop here and um, we will take um, any further questions that might arise. Uh, we have uh, ministers from the various um, uh, MDAs that will be happy to take uh, further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, National Coordinator. Um, today is a loaded day, and um, we will urge that you kindly uh, restrict your questions to issues raised uh, in the remarks of the 
chairman of the presidential task force, as well as the explanation uh, provided by the national coordinator. For those watching who might want to send in their questions, your WhatsApp number is still 070-53-53-6666. It should be scrolling on your screen uh, by now. So you can send in your questions and we'll factor them into our considerations. So can we start the question session? Good evening, sir. My name is Friday Okeribe. I'm a reporter with Channel TV. Uh, I would like to take the national coordinator on the my first to respond to my first question. You talked about uh, the restriction on movement in high burdened local governments, even though there is um, a little ease in the interstate movement, except uh, provided it is not in the curfew hours. Now that we do not know the identity of those high burden local governments, how are you going to enforce those restrictions? Then the second question that is also similar to that, which I also want you to uh, respond to, it has to do with uh, the interstate travel. I know that many times when the PTF issues some guidelines or protocols, they subject it to the approval of the, the, the state governors. We are aware of some state governors who do not want to, rest, to, to open interstate travel in their state, they don't want other states to travel through their states. Is this little relaxation on interstate travel also subject to the approval of state governors? Can a state governor say, I do not want, for instance, we have Kogi, for instance, as a transit state to many other states. Can such state say, I do not want anybody to travel through my states, or this is that you, you just announced is total, is final for everybody. And I would like to um, direct my second question to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, for, on Thursday, I actually wanted to ask it, but he was not here. I'd like to know what is the criteria for evacuating uh, Nigerians that are stranded abroad? Those who want evacuation. What is the criteria? What is the procedure for enlisting them for evacuation? And for the PTF chairman, sir, I would like you to, to respond to this. Now that we are anticipating that soon the local flights will be open, there is this anxiety that there will be increase in the price of uh, air tickets. Is the federal government considering any form of maybe palliative to the, to the air, the operators, and maybe some other... Um, service providers at the airport with the aim of reducing air ticket for travelers. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Chairman of the PTF and other members of the PTF. My name is Yemi Adebayo from AIT. Uh, my first question is to the SGF, sir. Uh, for many of us who had followed uh, the briefing by the PTF, we understand the fact that enforcement of these guidelines perhaps is a major problem. During the first phase, we had an extension of a week or two. Now the second phase, we are having another four weeks extension. Despite this, the figures of confirmed cases keep going up on a daily basis. Are you confident or are you saying, sir, that the extension would afford public health officials or the health ministry the opportunity to further unless the opportunity that they have in addressing some of the issues that we have as a stance. Because it's one thing for us to roll out the fresh guidelines and it's one thing for us to see the results. Do you think this extension would help in fighting this virus? Then I think the second question has to do, someone, someone wants to know, on Saturday, the PTF uh, team where at the airports in Lagos and in Abuja. Someone wants to know, the three hours that you're supposed to be in the airport before you actually board the flight, what is going to be, which kind of checks is going to be carried out on you? Is it that you're going to run through a COVID-19 test or what's going to happen? Then finally on interstate tra uh, travel, 
Even before now, people are traveling here and there. Now, the ban on interstate has finally been lifted. Don't you see that we'll have more transmission of this virus across? Thank you, sir. Good evening, all. Rachel Abuja from the News Agency of Nigeria. My first question is to the chairman. Sir, what particular lessons are there to learn from the experience of countries that had had to repose the lockdown after recording spike in positive cases? Now, my next question is for the Minister of Health. Sir, regarding the team of experts inaugurated, headed by um, Professor Tomori, I would like to know specifically what does their suggestion and contribution be in this fight against COVID-19? Many thanks. Gentlemen, I think we made clear from the beginning that this particular session is dedicated solely and exclusively to the new guidelines. We don't want this message to be diluted. Nigerians want to know what is the new normal from 1st of July. They want to know, would they be able to travel from state to state? They want to know, would the mosques and churches be opened? They want to know, would the schools be opened? I think this is what is German to them. Please, if there's any question from the outside which has no bearing to these issues, please will not entertain them and please don't ask them. If you asked a question last week and the minister was not there, don't bring it here today unless it has something to do with what the chairman and the national coordinator, you know, what they have presented. We want to make sure that Nigerians actually get the real message. For four weeks, they've persevered. They want to know what is the new normal. Please, thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, Chairman and members of the Presidential Task Force. My name is Mitaire Ikwe, and I report for the Nigerian Television Authority. Uh, on one hand, the presidential task force just told us that the 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. overnight curfew nationwide remains, uh, but that interstate travel is permitted outside curfew hours. I think there's need for further clarification on this, especially when a citizen is uh, still in transit uh, during curfew hours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I yielded the microphone to our colleagues, uh, I stated clearly that we'll be taking questions around the presentation of the chairman and the explanation provided by the national coordinator. All questions that have been asked outside that region will not be answered today. We will concentrate on the main subject uh, that we are dealing with today, which is the new normal as explained by the Minister of Information. I thank you very much. The questions have come in now. We have them directed at the Honorable Minister of Health, the National Coordinator, and the, sec, uh, the chairman of the presidential uh, task force. But for reasons that are very, very genuine, we will take the intervention of just the national coordinator and the chairman of the presidential task force. So we'll begin with the national coordinator before the, national, the, the chairman rounds it up. The national coordinator, please. 
So um, just some clarifications. First of all, the restriction of movement in specific local governments. Um, we're still working with the state governments, as people would um, obviously realize. You cannot um, lock down local governments without working with the states. We have identified these local governments. Some of them have uh, issues to do with their location or geographic location and the fact that they do not have defined borders. We will be sending out clarification as soon as we finish this piece of work. The restriction of movement in these local governments is only one of several interventions that we are putting in uh, in terms of the hotspots. Um, we will be precision targeting these areas not only to increase testing but also to improve isolation and to make sure that we do a lot of uh, risk communication and public awareness activities. So the cessation of movement is only part of it and some of the local governments may not, it may not be practicable to do so. We already know some local governments that um, will be impossible to enforce this. But overall, what we are trying to do is to put out the small fires across the country. Rather than trying to fight a raging fire across the whole country, which will be very difficult and will also be damaging economically for us. So for those areas that we know have very high burden, where the numbers are increasing rapidly, where we have a high positivity rate, we will, we will be introducing specific precision measures, working with the state governments to make sure that we get on top of this. And this will be um, a job that will continue to be reviewed regularly. We expect some local governments to drop after the interventions and some to be added. In terms of uh, opening of interstate travel, whether the state governments have been consulted, yes. We have been working with the state governors. Um, in fact, um, some of the states actually approached us um, towards the end of this phase to specifically request that the borders be opened. As we know, the compliance level in terms of um, um, compliance with the restrictions hasn't been as um, the percentage compliance hasn't been as high as we would have wanted it to, to be. People who are still traveling. Um, we still continue to maintain um, um, free travel in terms of free movement, in terms of goods and essential travel, even during the, the curfew hours. But we expect people to plan their travel to make sure that wherever you are, certainly the curfew 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. remains. Um, in terms of aviation, somebody was asking why do they need to spend three hours at the airport? Well, you could miss your plane. Anything that um, will not wait for you, it's better you go and wait for it. Um, when it comes to the new normal, and you, people would have seen this on TV, you'll have your temperature checked at the point of entry into the airport. You'll have your temperature checked at the point of boarding. You will have hand sanitization at the point of access to the airport. You'll have hand sanitization when you are boarding the, the, the plane. There, there are so many additional things that have been added. Limitations in terms of physical distancing. We, we cannot have the same number of people in a waiting area. So all these will add up to more time being spent in the airport. So if you don't want to miss your flight, we advise that you get there early. And uh, for domestic flights, certainly the aviation authorities, the advice they are giving is you get there early, preferably up to three hours before your flight. But if you are a last minute person, then good luck. But certainly that's our advice. Um, free movement, okay. The issue of, um, I think I have addressed uh, most of these issues. The other thing is whether, why did we keep the curfew? Well, we're not back to normal. As, you, as stated earlier on by one of the persons asking the questions, the numbers are still going up. There's no doubt about it. Yes, we are testing, but we also know that the level of compliance when it comes to the non-pharmaceutical interventions is not high. So we're still having a raging pandemic. We're still, having, we're still in the exponential phase. So some restrictions will have to remain. And those restrictions that will limit social interactions without affecting severely the economic prospects for the country will remain in place, such as uh, recreational activities, gyms, etc., and such as nightlife. So that's why we've maintained the curfew, because we know that we are not back to normal. We hope that with the extension of the current phase, 
um, the public would continue to work with us and support us to make sure that we get things done properly and this time around we get on top of the pandemic. If the pandemic continues to uh, increase as it is, then the PTF will be forced to review some of the measures that we have introduced now. Thank you. I now invite the chairman of the PTF. Thank you. I think uh, let me quickly run through some. Well, uh, how I wish the Minister of Aviation were, uh, was here to take the issue about the increase in air tickets. I think there's basically increase on everything. Not only air tickets. If you go to the market now, the prices prior to COVID-19 is different from what you get in the market now. That is the difficulty that is going to confront us as a people. And because of the protocols that are going to be introduced in the whole business of uh, aviation, you would definitely expect an increase in the prices. Uh, FAN has already uh, increased uh, its uh, customer services fare with 100%. You used to pay for the customer services, I think it's a thousand naira. Now it's two thousand naira even before the operations start. So it's not only the airlines, even the government institutions who have the responsibility of managing the aviation industry who review their charges because that is the nature of what COVID-19 has thrust on the people of the country and all over the world. And more so that there is going to be the maintenance of some bit of social distancing on the aircraft. If an aircraft has a capacity of 150 people, they might now be restricted to about 100 or 75. Flying comes with components of course. Aviation fuel is one of it. Salaries for the pilots and the cabin crew is part of it. Services that are paid for to the aviation industry institutions. Every time you see a plane take off, there is an attendant cost to that. Who will bear the cost? It will be shared. To be shared. The passengers will take part of it. The business owners will take part of the cost. But you know that nobody runs a business at a loss. Profit is the motivation for going into business, isn't it? Flying is not a social service. They will find a way of recouping their money. So we must be prepared for this cost. As to whether government would help the industry, I believe Friday the aviation industry is one of the industries that is hard hit by this COVID-19. Because it's an industry that is designed for moving people up and down. And for the last three months they have not done anything. So I think as part of the intervention of government through either the central bank or the uh, stimulus uh, package in the economic sustainability plan of the 2.3 trillion, I believe the aviation industry would have a part of that. How it is going to be administered, uh, the Minister for uh, uh, Aviation will be in a better position to explain how that will be administered. There was a question from AIT uh, whether the extension would afford us to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, the, the essence of the extension is to allow us to do a thorough review and consolidate on the gains that have been achieved in the past. 
and to see how we can further drive the message. The message has been basically simple and easy. Bear in mind that there is no cure available. Vaccines are way ahead in terms of availability and procurement. The only message we have for fighting COVID-19 is what I stated this afternoon in my paragraph six, where I said, by way of a reminder, there is presently known Known vaccine for the virus, and that all over the world, non pharmaceutical measures still remain the most effective fighting opportunity we have for overcoming this pandemic. That's the only thing you have. So, even when we have secured this extension of four weeks, the major agenda of the task force in conjunction with the state governments, the local communities, the leaderships, the religious bodies, the civil societies, and all those that are involved in driving this response will be to make people conscious of the fact that they have to take responsibility. And the only way they can take responsibility is to adhere to the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have put in place. Simple matters. All over the world, that's the only thing that is working. That's the only thing that is working. As to prescriptions of drugs to be used for the cure. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Everybody is doing trial and error. And that's why you find today is this drug, tomorrow is a different one. We will continue along that until a vaccine is discovered or probably a cure is cured. The other question is uh, the experiences of the lockdown of other countries and uh, whether we are learning from those experiences. Uh, Rachel, we are. We've learned from those experiences. We've seen how uh, countries that have even flatten the curve. Those that have peaked and flattened the curve and they relaxed or they eased up on the restrictions and all of a sudden they begin to witness resurgence of spikes of infections around certain cities. And that dovetails into the precision lockdown that we are putting in place to take care of that. Because even in this situation now, they don't lock down the entire nation like it were in the past. They go for precision lockdown. A typical example, in New Zealand, I think they are locking down a region. In China, as a matter of fact, they are locking down communities so that they can deal with the resurgence that is occurring in those particular places. You see, the irony of our situation is that we have not even picked. We have not even picked. And that was what informed what I said uh, on Thursday last week when I said if it were within my power I would recommend a lockdown. Because we have not even picked. We are just picking. We are yet to get to the top. I'm not saying this to scare Nigerians. But there's the reality of the fact of the matter. Our figures will grow. Probably by the time we return in a month's time or within the next uh, four weeks, our figures will not be 24,000. If you look at the modeling and the projections, we will be somewhere around 40, 45,000. That's where we are going to be. But you see, that now drives the home, I mean the point home. That you and I are the ones that are responsible for this thing. We are the ones that are carrying it all over the place. It doesn't go on its own. And we are the only ones that can abet the ferocious nature of the transmission in the communities. 
as to whether well the numbers are growing why are you allowing for interstate travel at the end of the day we in place that because we wanted to restrict people transmitting to the communities but we found out that it's not working as a matter of fact what we succeeded in doing is that we created another enterprise another side business to the extent that it was costing ordinary Nigerians more than necessary to travel illegally from one point to the other because we had an interstate ban. So it was not a, a legal trip if you embarked on it. People were paying so much to embark on those unnecessary illegal trips. Even my good friend in Kaduna who was spending sleepless nights with his deputy and his commissioners manning the borders, realized that it was not working. And like Dr. Sani rightly said, we consulted very well with the state governors. They have tried to ensure compliance and enforcement. It has not worked. Whether it is adversely going to affect our numbers now, I would say scientifically, not much. Because we are already at the community level transmission. Because one infected man comes to into a community where you already have a thousand infections or a hundred infections. It wouldn't do much. So it is very important that we realize that yes, we are learning from the experiences of other countries. Even other can these countries are very disciplined countries. It was something that weighed heavily on us when we were considering what happens with pupils and students returning back to school to prepare for their exams. We had to weigh it. It's not an easy decision. But we are mindful of the fact that even prior to COVID-19, we have 15 million children out of school. So what do you do with those that are in school? Do they constitute part of this now? Or do you do something? Measure the risk and see how best you can help the graduating ones. We are not talking about everybody going back to school. It's only the graduating classes in the primary level primary six. If you don't do something about them, they can't transit to the secondary school level. So they will lose a year. The same thing with JS3. If you don't do anything, because they can only qualify to move if they pass a certain examination. So if we stop them, it means that we would have uh, uh, scuttled uh, the prospect of people graduating to classes. The same thing with SS3. There is a certain examination that qualifies you to go into the university. That's why, in addition to JAM or whatever other qualifications you have, WAIC is not under our exclusive control. The five Anglophone West African countries constitute WAIC. If the other four are ready to start examination, say, in the month of August. Nigeria cannot isolate itself. So it means that the entire people that would have graduated to go to the universities for the next academic year would not be able to graduate. And those are the balances that we took into consideration by saying that, okay, these classes that will be graduating, can we do something to accommodate them in such a way that they will just show up for the purposes of the examination but prior to that, some of them might want to do revision. Knowing fully well that in the last three months they have been lying, I mean, they've been, I have one in my house, so I know what they're doing. When you come in, they pretend to be busy on their laptops. But immediately you exit, the eight hours you are out of the house, it's a different board game. I'm a father too, so I know what is happening. You always have stories to tell you of what they did in the, in the, uh, in the day. But, we, we, we are looking at a situation where we will be helpful to them, not to destroy their future, 
but also to balance it with the risk of their getting infected. So it's, it's a lot of work. And uh, I can assure you that all the gentlemen and the ladies that you see on this side of the divide have had to spend sleepless nights trying to balance this thing so that whatever steps we take will be in an attempt to balance lives and livelihood. Because whether we want to believe it or not, in the last one or two weeks, I think the World Bank and IMF released a report and a projection for which it, 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 it projected that our economy will go into deeper recession. Not deep, deeper recession with a GDP growth rate estimated at minus 5.2 stroke minus 5.5 respectively by December 2020. In addition to that, their projection shows that 5 million Nigerians would go into very abject and deep poverty. Yeah? No, no, no. 95 million. How can it be 95 million? 5 million Nigerians will go into abject poverty if necessary steps are not taken. If necessary steps are not taken. I'm not talking about those that are already there. In addition, as a result of the COVID-19, we already have a high number of those that are already in the bracket. But this is what we will now add to if necessary steps are not taken. So in the whole of the guidelines that we have tried to release, an attempt, a modest attempt is being made by the presidential task force to balance this. And good enough, our president was very proactive when he decided to set up the Economic Sustainability Committee. And that committee has submitted its report. The Federal Executive Council has, has deliberated over it. It's being adopted. It's a 12 month interventionist plan that would project or infuse about 2.3 trillion naira into the economy to create jobs, to sustain businesses in the construction, in the transport, and several other sectors. That's a very good development. And that is what is going to help us as a country to mitigate and moderate the impact of this projection by the World Bank and IMF. The only thing that we will hasten to do is to ensure speedy implementation. Because it's supposed to be the lifespan of the of the of the plan is supposed to be twelve months. So within twelve months we must try as much as possible to infuse the two point three trillion naira into the economy. That way you generate a lot of businesses, a lot of livelihoods that would sustain the economy. In closing, these guidelines are designed to help us as a nation drive our response. My appeal to Nigerians is that, like I said, the only important and known process that will help us in our fight against COVID-19 is to adhere to the non-pharmaceutical interventions. For now, no cure, no vaccine, no drugs. So what do we do? Let's comply with these non-pharmaceutical interventions. Wear your mask in public places. Maintain social distancing. Keep yourself clean through hand washing and sanitizing your hands. Avoid unnecessary travels. Don't congregate in crowded places. If need be, stay at home as much as you can. In my entire 60 plus years of livelihood, I don't think I've ever stayed at home as much as I've done in the last three months. Because my routine is very simple. House, office, villa, meeting venue, back house, office. That's what I've been doing in the last three months. And I will continue as much as possible because I have a responsibility to myself to protect myself 
and in return, or by extension, protect my family and loved ones. And that is what I urge all of you to do. You have exposed yourselves greatly in the service of the nation. As you continue to do it, please, the watch word is that you must stay safe, you must try as much as possible to ensure that whatever happens, at the end of the day, all said and done, you will be counted as the ones that are standing. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much, Chairman, Presidential Task Force. That brings us to the end of today's national briefing by the task force. I urge our colleagues to continue to digest the document that's been circulated so that you can uh, generate uh, further discourse around it and um, ensure that uh, it's disseminated. Well, as a reminder, let's just go through a few things. We still have a raging uh, pandemic. The curfew is sustained. We urge you to take responsibility. We want you to mobilize your community to create awareness, to wear your mask in public places, await, and stu await study, and adhere to the guidelines to be issued by the education, trans uh, transportation, and aviation sectors. Get our children in critical exam classes ready for their revision and their examinations. Probably have never seen or known anybody who has contracted COVID-19. But COVID-19 is real. As we make our daily plans, we must remember that it is still a threat. You must protect yourself and others from getting sick. This virus has no cure yet and it does not discriminate. Help to halt the spread, stop the rumors, stop the stigma. Please stay informed. Adhere to the guidelines. They are your fighting opportunities for survival. I thank you very much. God bless Nigeria. We hope to see you on Thursday. Thank you. All right, the daily briefing by the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 just ended there. And before we rejoined the PTF briefing, we read out a report on godfatherism that may have positive impact on electoral processes. And Daniel Adiri has that report. Let's take it again. It is known to run a multi-party system, but managing political parties with all the vested interests comes with various challenges. However, guests on Good Morning Nigeria say these challenges could be addressed if parties are managed based on futuristic rather than opportunistic principles. You have a situation where uh, uh, people move in and out of political parties as if the political parties don't matter. So what we have are merely entrepreneurial parties which enable people to use them as platform uh, uh, to, 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 to win elections rather than political parties who are have been established and developed to win power and run government effectively. The electorate also partake in this particular situation we find ourselves. They are supposed to be the determinant of corrective change, but unfortunately they have studied the present dispensation and understand that the people that they vote for do not actually give them what they want. And so therefore, they look for how to get what they want as a people before even electing you as a person. While the guests equally noted that while the issue of Godfatherism remains prevalent and relevant, political parties must shift away from being run like a business. There is positive Godfatherism, but the one dealing with us right now is the negative Godfatherism. Every party has a disciplinary committee. But I cannot respect you when I paid you to, to, to become a candidate. I paid you money. The relationship we had was transactional. For me to be a candidate of the party, apart from my expression of interest form and the rest of the things that I virtually had to pay you money to get that ticket. So when you say you want to discipline me, I look at you and, 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 and say, who, who, who are you? You know, it's hypocritical. If what we want power for is, is, to, is to make money and I invest. And then you tell me, you pretend as if, you know, it's moral instructions now. You know, I should just go there, spend my money, nurture this party. 
with the hope of gaining power and then getting access to the national commonwealth. And then you tell me, you know, I'm a bad person. You know, it's a political of all of us, you know, to think that way. The guest urged political parties to aspire to become institutions with deep-rooted democratic values. In Abuja, Daniel Adirie, NT News. In talking security, the establishment of Army Forward Operation Base and 171 Battalion in Dauraka Sina State has fortified the area against emerging security threats. The Emir of Daura, Umar Farouk Umar, stated this while receiving Chief of the Army Staff Lieutenant General Tuko Buratei on Katsi visit to the Emirate. The Royal Father commended President Muhammad Buhari for his political will towards fighting insecurity in the country and expressed confidence in the ability of the military to eradicate threats, truncate and socio-economic activities in the country. Defense correspondent Ismail Musa reports that the army chief was also at Batsari where he assured residents of ongoing drive to end security challenges in the area. Send the troops, all right, they will be here and we're getting more equipment and uh, we're also gathering more uh, you know, information and we need their, report, their, their support to give us information on those uh, criminals. Surely it will make a difference. Lieutenant General Buratei also interfaced with the armed forces, special forces troops in Batsari Kassina State. All right, let's now join our correspondent, Mitari, um, to give us an update on the PTF briefing that just ended earlier. So, Mitari. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 today announced an extension of the second phase of the easing of lockdown, uh, and this for another four weeks. So this will last uh, a period of four weeks from June 30th to midnight of July 27th, 2020. Uh, uh, some of the uh, guidelines uh, have been lifted and uh, others, other restrictions still sustained in this phase. One of the restrictions uh, that was sustained in this phase is uh, the overnight nationwide curfew remains. Uh, the curfew usually lasts from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. So the curfew remains. However, inter the interstate travel ban has been conditionally lifted. Conditionally lifted because uh, interstate travel is only permitted outside the curfew hours. That's according to the presidential task force. And also, schools are to remain closed except for pupils and students in uh, graduating classes. That's those writing common entrance, uh, JSS3 and uh, SS3 exams. They will be guided to resume their revision and preparation for their final exams. Also, mass gatherings and uh, mass gatherings and sporting activities remain banned during this uh, four-week period of extension of the second phase of the lockdown. And finally, just to note that no changes have been made to the ex existing guidelines for government offices as well as uh, churches and mosques, which, also, which implies that uh, government workers can still go to, go to work from Mondays to Fridays, but of course only uh, level f those in grade level 14 and above. So those are some of the guidelines that will characterize this uh, four-week extension of the second phase of the easing of lockdown as announced by the presidential task force. Well, Mitari, good news for a lot of Nigerians, especially the interstate travel, like you said, conditionally lifted, and also for the graduating students, you know, that will be allowed to write the exams. Thank you very much for that update there. All right, let's take a break. We're back shortly with Nationwide. The number of the COVID-19 cases in Nigeria is increasing daily with many more tests ongoing. The battle of testing, isolating, treating and attending to the affected persons rests heavily on the shoulders of our health workers, constantly putting their lives on the line and at risk to contain this virus. Save 
and protect the lives of millions of Nigerians. To these health workers, we at the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, on behalf of millions of Nigerians, say a big thank you for all that you have done and are doing. To the security agencies enforcing the lockdown and every other frontliner, we say thank you for putting your lives on the line to save ours. There is no amount of words that can quantify our gratitude. Thank you. This message is brought to you by the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, Africa's largest television network. Welcome there. Have you washed your hands? Inside my house again. This is not the key black man. Ah! I don't know if it's misinformation or poor hygiene that will kill you first. Coronavirus is real and good hygiene practice will save your life. Oh. Anyway, no hand washing, no eating. I will not take care of you. virus is real and it's on the rise. But you can help yourself and help others to be safe. Remember, we can stop the spread. It's in your hands. This message is from the Akin Fadei Foundation in partnership with the National Orientation Agency with support from MacArthur Foundation. Okay, guys, um, let's do this. Action. You can deceive everyone, but you certainly cannot deceive me. I see you. But if the package is faulty, there'll be no bias. So I suggest you sit down and have a talk with your husband. So you have faith. Mm. Everything is possible. Oh. You heard him, right? You needed help and I helped you. This place will do so. The doors will work. You mean you still work for Matthew Osage? What? Nigerians, let us take responsibility. Stay healthy, stay safe, and curb the spread of the virus. Take responsibility. The coronavirus spreads from one person to another. Let us avoid crowd gathering of any kind for any reason. Take responsibility. Avoid traveling from one state to another during these lockdown restrictions. Obey all the rules that are put in place. Take responsibility. Stop spreading fake news and unverified reports about the coronavirus. There is no known cure for COVID-19. Take responsibility. Observe all the measures that can help stop the spread of the virus. Together, we can do this, but only if we take responsibility. This message is brought to you by the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, Africa's largest television network. Good to have you back. Let's go to Meduguri to join Mohammed. He has reports for us nationwide. Thank you, Ruth, and viewers. Welcome to Meduguri. The federal government has restated commitment to ending the decade-long insurgency and other criminalities in the country. This was disclosed during a sympathy visit by a high-powered presidential delegation to government and people of Borno over the recent terror attacks on some communities in the state. Mohamed Goni reports that the delegation was led by the National Security Advisor, Major General Babagana Mungono, retired. The sympathy visit was in continuation of the National Security Advisor's tour of states recently affected by acts of terror and criminalities, which led to loss of lives and property. General Babagana Mungono retired said, President Muhammad Buhari specifically asked him to come along with his colleagues in the security formation to condole Governor Babagana Umara and the Shoho of Borno over terror attacks on communities in Gubio and Mongono local government areas. Mr. President has directed that we review our strategy with a view to bringing to an end this situation in which our people in Borno State find themselves. The NSA also noted Governor Babagana Umara's efforts since assumption of office in dealing with the security situation, seeking collaboration with the higher command of the security architecture to end the insurgency. 
adding that the governor has been a source of inspiration to all the people of Borno. Governor Babagana Omara thanked the delegation for the sympathy visit and further appreciated the Minister for Humanitarian Affairs, Sadia Omar Farouk, for the support to the state towards ending the insurgency. Government of Borno State and indeed the people of Borno State are overwhelmed with the renewed effort that has been made by this president in ending the insurgency. The governor also appreciated commitment of the National Assembly to the cause of the Northeast. The delegation was also at the palace of the Shehu of Borno, Abu Bakr ibn Umar Garbay El Kanemi, for the message of condolence. Shehu Abu Bakr ibn Umar Garbay El Kanemi also called for a renewed commitment to bring the terror attacks to an end and further appealed to the federal government to intervene in construction of major roads in the state. In Maiduguri, Mahmoud Boni, NTA News. The United States government has reiterated its administration's determination towards managing and containing the coronavirus pandemic through provision of testing facilities and resources for containment in areas of need. Governor Babagana Umara stated this while receiving COVID-19 sample collection booths and other equipment donated by MMT Technology Nigeria Limited at the government house made degree. Jadwa John Justin reports. Receiving the items. Governor Babagana Umara directed the State High Powered Committee on COVID-19 to examine the efficiency of the items to enable the state government procure more and deploy to areas requiring intervention. The governor described the move by MMT Technologies as commendable and timely, calling on other well-to-do individuals, organizations, and establishments to emulate them as the fight needs collective support. But most importantly, we want to partner with you, all this innovation. We want to promote Imagine technology that will be very beneficial to our people in the areas of agriculture, in the areas of health, in the areas of water for supply and sanitation, among others. Chief Executive MMT Technologies Mohammed Mustafa Imam took time to demonstrate methods for using the equipment which he described as user friendly. The best way for us to get help and then to put it everywhere is to donate a sample so the government to see. He further disclosed that the two items donated has an automatic temperature measuring device as well as sanitizer with a sensor to determine a person's COVID-19 status. In Medugri, Jadwa John Jesse, NTA News. That will be all from Medugri is back to Ruth in Abuja. Thank you, Mohammed. He's young, intelligent, lovable, and very easygoing. He's the first child of his parents. Like most children, his age um, his age, he dreams of becoming a medical doctor, but a sudden dreadful incident is not only threatening his dream, but also his life. Mom saw Damien that he will unravel this mystery. Charming smiles of a happy family, Abdulaziz Haruna, his wife and children, all looking good and hopeful. His first son, Iman, is an exceptional child. At 12, he's already taking responsibility as the big brother loving, cheerful, intelligent, and full of life with so many prospects lying ahead for him. All looks beautiful and rosy. Suddenly, the story changed. Fears are now in the eyes of the entire family. Tears for an African man may indicate a sign of weakness and can be so embarrassing, except in very rare occasions where powerful emotions take over. That is the case with Abdulaziz and his family, as tears drop in open abandon to relieve anguish and great fear for the unknown. No matter how long you live on this world, you go. The death is inevitable. But what sport pays me for him is it's too young. The experience of a, of a first child to his father, you know what it means. It's my closest child, this course, like me. Never expected this. We do see these things on television elsewhere. We just keep praying for those people and wish it never comes to us. So this came to us as a shock. It's very depressing. I know how we've been trying to put my brother together. He's not, he used to be very equally, he used to be almost my size. Yes. He's, he's just been so trimmed down because of this whole thing. It all started in 2018 with a fever and high temperature. I was having a teacher's morning and severe, and severe head pain. I was diagnosed of kidney, of kidney failure. It was very healthy. 
very, very healthy. If you see his pictures, you won't believe. All of a sudden, well, this happens. We were admitted on the referral letter. It was recommended that he should be dialyzed. But that was the first time I knew about dialysis. And they told me there are some death in the kidney that need to be washed for like three times weekly. Like in this hospital now, in both children and adults, it's 25,000 per section. Today, the situation has brought Iman to a level that is life-threatening. The definite treatment for him is, is kidney transplant. That's just the possibility, the only option for him. I get the money, I get it done, because the longer it is, the risk attached to it. He needs a kidney transplant urgently, and his own mother has volunteered to donate one of her kidneys. It's a condition of no option. What will I do? It was advised that he, he, he got that from a close relation. I actually lost my job. I actually lost my job 2015. Since then, uh, been hustling. Eamon wants to actualize his dream of becoming a medical doctor to save lives. Eamon wants to live because he's Nigeria's future. Eamon has rights as a child and a promising future that must not be cut short for any reason whatsoever. But his own life needs to be saved first. And 10.3 million naira is all that is needed to keep him and his dream alive. And then to give me money and you put it for me for my transplant to be successful. Mom so Damien Dati and she news. Okay. Imam needs your help. If you can reach out, please do. If you're watching us right now, you can reach out to the family of Imam through the Nigerian Television Authority and they will be deeply, deeply grateful. That's it on the news. We do appreciate your time. Bye.